Uh, thank the organizers of PopTech for giving me this opportunity. Um, it's indeed a great privilege to be here. And I particularly value the choice of the theme that you've come up with this year, because I really think we should look at the whole issue of balancing several factors that have been influenced by human activities and those in turn influence human activities today and will do so tomorrow. But while thanking them, let me also register a complaint. And that's the fact that I'm following President Grimson. <laughs> I mean, that's a very hard act to follow. So that's highly unfair. <laughs> but I can also say that I'm carrying a heavy sense of guilt because uh, I was in uh, New Haven last week and I flew from here to Ethiopia because I had to go for an imp important event in Africa. And then I've flown all the way here, reaching here late last night around midnight. So I've got a terrible carbon footprint which just keeps accumulating. And people often ask me, and I'm sure someone from the audience will ask me later, uh, what do you do about your carbon footprint? And the two responses I give is, well, first in my own personal life, uh, other than flying, I do try to minimize uh, whatever demands I might have as a human being that would have an impact on carbon dioxide emissions. And um, secondly, since I was born a Hindu, I can believe in my next reincarnation <laughs> when I'll try to do something about my carbon footprint. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I want to tell you about um, some of the um, results of the work of the IPCC, uh, which I think certainly would make us ponder on how we might be able to rebalance some of the activities, some of the impacts that we have created on the Earth's climate as uh, human beings. I also would like to mention the fact that um, we clearly have to take a long-term view of this. Of course, that doesn't mean that we can escape by not taking action in the immediate future. So let me uh, get into some uh, results that I'd like to project for you. And I'll start by showing you this particular diagram, which shows you the changes in greenhouse gases from ice core and modern data. And you know, th this ice core data, for instance, uh, is being collected in Greenland, and I've been there. It's a remarkable experience, because Greenland, as you know, is the largest island on this Earth, apart from Australia, which is a continent by itself. And um, you have a, a huge mountain of ice covering that uh, piece of land, which is about three kilometers high on the average. And as you go deeper and deeper, you're mining ice cores that go back in time. And they give you a remarkable signature of what the state of physical and chemical uh, variables were at that point of time a long, long while ago. Now, this is a figure that you might have seen in Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth, for those of you who've seen the movie. But to dramatize, uh, the sharp increase that you see over here in recent years, in recent decades, he gets onto an elevator, and they haven't provided me one over here. So I'm afraid you'll just have to take your eyes along this steep increase that you find over here. I won't be able to follow it physically by going up. Uh, what I also want to tell you is that the atmospheric concentrations of some of these greenhouse gases have increased at a very rapid rate. Now, in the case of uh, uh, carbon dioxide, it's largely due to fossil fuel use and deforestation that we've had an increase in carbon dioxide concentrations and emissions. And in the case of uh, uh, methane and oxides of nitrogen, it's essentially agricultural, pastoral, and animal-related activities that are responsible. Of course, President Grimson told us about the volcanic eruption. And uh, when volcanoes erupt, it has the opposite effect. So that was 
quite apart from all the renewable energy that Iceland uses, uh, they also mitigated emissions of greenhouse gases by spewing out this huge quantity of volcanic material that he described a little while ago. Uh, however, what I'd like to say is that there's reason for concern because the rate at which the emissions of greenhouse gases is increasing is, um, uh, is, is really much faster than we have seen in the past. Uh, I also want to mention the fact that between 1970 and 2004, there's been a 70% increase in emissions of greenhouse gases. So in a sense, you could conclude that the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is really not being implemented effectively. And that convention, as you're aware, came into existence in 1992. Uh, let me tell you what the projections uh, indicate in terms of specific scenarios of economic, political, demographic changes that the Earth is going to witness in the future. Uh, if you look at the range that we've projected uh, in our fourth assessment report, you get something ranging from 1.1 degrees Celsius to 6.4 degrees Celsius increase by the end of the century. Now, it's important to remember that during the 20th century, we had an average increase of 0 0.74 degrees Celsius. Uh, with this range, clearly, uh, you can't focus on what might really happen. So we did much further analysis and came up with two what we call best estimates. At the lower end, the best estimate was 1.8 degrees Celsius. At the upper end, it was 4 degrees Celsius. Now, if you take even the 1.8 degrees Celsius increase, add that to the 0 0.74 degrees that took place in the last century, you have an increase of over 2.5 degrees Celsius. And as you know, the negotiations that are going on at the international level under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change have clearly now reached an agreement of sorts that we are going to limit temperature increase to about 2 degrees Celsius. Now, I'll say a little more about that. But I also want to tell you that if you're talking about rebalancing uh, the climate of the Earth, then really speaking, it was 125,000 years ago that you had temperatures higher than what we are seeing today. And this, of course, led to sea level rise of four to six meters. I'm not for a moment suggesting that the same thing will happen now, but clearly, if you look at historical geological information, this is where we were earlier. And paleoclimatic information supports uh, the interpretation that the warmth of the last uh, half century is unusual in at least the previous 1,300 years. So therefore, we are doing something to the climate of this Earth. And we came to two very important conclusions that most of, firstly, that warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And secondly, that most of the, the warming that had taken place since the middle of the last century uh, was on account of increase in anthropogenic or human-induced concentrations of greenhouse gases. There are also going to be other impacts of climate change on water resources, for instance. Countries like Bangladesh, China, and India are particularly vulnerable in this regard. And in the case of India, you've got numbers which show you that by 2050, the per capita availability of water would be about two-thirds of what we have today. And this is happening largely because of the rapid melting of glaciers uh, and glacial runoff and frequency of glacial lake out outbursts. This can lead to another set of problems, which would be essentially mud flows, avalanches, and so on, which are already on the increase. So the entire water cycle, in a sense, is being affected by the impacts of climate change. We also know that there are uh, extremely serious impacts on agriculture. I was in Ethiopia just uh, four days ago, and uh, one major concern, there were a number of leaders from all over Africa at that major conference, which was essentially about development and climate change. And one major concern, which of course is something we substantiated in our fourth assessment report, was the fact 
that in some countries of Africa, as early as 2020, you might get a decline of 50% in the yields of some crops. Now, these are farmers who are dependent on rain-fed agriculture, and clearly, they're not producing any of their crops essentially for the market. Most of it is for self-consumption, so that they can keep body and soul together. And if there's going to be a decline in yields as we have projected, this has major implications for uh, food security on that continent. Uh, have I done something wrong? There's something on the screen. <laughs> well, pop tech is a little too technological for me, so <laughs> anyway, let me continue. Uh, what I'd like to also mention is that there would be major impacts on human health. And uh, this is essentially because of a number of factors. Firstly, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, because there would be malnutrition with implications for child growth and development, deaths, disease, and injury due to heat waves, floods, storms, fires, droughts. One important conclusion we came up with is that there is already an increase in the frequency and in some cases the intensity of floods, droughts, heat waves, extreme precipitation events, and as a result of heat waves, you also have many more forest fires and so on. There would also be deaths, disease, and injury on account of some of these extreme events, and diarrheal diseases on the increase, and of course, frequency of cardiorespiratory diseases is also going up based on records that we have. So health would be impacted by climate change. But another possibility, and this is not something that we're making as a projection, but it's clearly a possibility that you could have a major loss of ice sheets in areas like Greenland and West Antarctica, uh, which, if they were to occur, would be abrupt and irreversible and can lead to sea level rise of several meters. We also carried out assessment of uh, species, and we found that a temperature increase of anywhere from 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius can lead to the threat of extinction of species to the extent of 20 to 30% of the species that we actually carried out an assessment of. Uh, we, we know that 25 to 40% of the mammal species in national parks in sub-Saharan Africa will become endangered. And uh, also as a result of the meridional overturning circulation being affected, and this is essentially what you call the Gulf Stream, and you see the flow of this stream over there on the map at the bottom, uh, there would be major impacts on marine life of all kinds. Um, Africa, of course, is one of the most vulnerable continents because not only uh, the impacts being much more serious in several parts of that continent, but also because there would be low adaptive capacity which exists right across the continent. So therefore, uh, there are substantial risks to some of the poorest regions in the world, which obviously have implications for the entire planet. And here I'd like to remind you of something that a uh, very distinguished economist, Kenneth Boulding, said, he said, we are all residents of Spaceship Earth. And you know, for us to believe that we are safe, uh, nothing's going to happen to us, is a very myopic view. It's much too short-sighted. And therefore, I think what we need to do is to look at some of the socio-economic implications of damage and destruction in any part of the globe, because um, that would have implications for all of us. Let me now turn to what can be done to meet the problem, to rebalance what we see as some kind of a perturbation in the climate system of the world. If you look at the top line of this particular table, if we want to uh, stabilize temperature increase to between 2 and 2.4 degrees Celsius, then we would have to stabilize the uh, concentration of greenhouse gases at the level that's shown over here. But the important thing to remember is that if we want to do this in a least cost manner, then CO2 emissions will need to peak no later than 2015. That's just four years away. So in other words, 
if we really want to pursue a least cost approach to stabilizing the Earth's climate, then we have a very limited and short window of opportunity. And this is where I think we need to bring about rapid change. Um, if you look at the sources of emissions, as it happens, 60 to 80 percent of the emissions uh, really come from energy supply and use in industrial processes. And yet, these are the areas where we're probably making the least progress. There are bright spots uh, in several parts of the world, including this country. I mean, if you look at the record of California, and I was told, for instance, that in Iowa today, about 20% of the power generating capacity is in the form of wind energy capacity, essentially through the initiative of farmers who have installed these on their own land. Then there are bright spots on the horizon, but the important thing is we've got to bring about a dissemination of some of these technologies and what they can do. We need to make sure that we realize the core benefits of uh, mitigation actions, and these core benefits are in the nature of energy security, much better health because of lower levels of air pollution, increased agricultural production, and certainly reduce pressure on natural ecosystems. Uh, we have carried out an assessment of renewable energy sources and uh, climate change mitigation, and we brought out a special report in May of this year where we've identified what can be done in this area and where technology stands, the costs associated with it. And really speaking, responding to climate change involves an iterative risk management approach. You know, in business and industry, people take decisions based on information which is not always perfect. You don't know how well your investment is going to do in the future, yet people do it. In the case of climate change, the same kind of logic should apply. We know enough by which we, if we were to make investments in some of these mitigation technologies, we can minimize risk to human society, to everything on this planet and all the species that exist. And I think it has to start with us. Gandhi said very rightly, you've got to be the change you want to see in the world. And invoking the spirit of Gandhi, I'd also like to say, we have to worry about some of the poorest regions in the world. Now here, let me put on my second hat, I'm also Director General of Terry, which is a large research institution employing about 1,000 people with a presence in several parts of the world. We have launched a major program called Lighting a Billion Lives, and I'd like to show you a little bit about that because this shows how you can bring about development, you can help people who are living in poverty and yet do it in a manner that is carbon friendly. So could we show the video, please?
So I think if we work together and think out of the box, then I certainly think we can meet some of the greatest challenges facing humanity. And this is just a small example of what innovative thinking can do and action to bring about change among the poorest of the poor. Thank you very much. Thank you.